SELFSI, Spoken Easy Language for Social Inclusion. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. It's nice to be talking about uh, the guidelines uh, of spoken easy language. My name is Laura Vilkaita Lozdiene, and I work at Vilnius University. So I will be representing Vilnius University team uh, of CELSI project. Yeah, so I want to present my team at Vilnius University, Justyna, Inga and Agne. And unfortunately, they are not here today with me, but I thought I would like to have them at least on the slide because these guidelines were very much a joint project of all the CELSI team, but also of uh, all the team of Vilnius University. So um, Essentially, the guidelines were created by whole project members, and here you can see all the organizations involved. And as Tatiana has already mentioned, we are a very international group of partners, and also we come from very different perspectives and very diff we bring very different experiences to the table. So we have universities, we have NGOs, we have um, uh, people working with radio broadcasters. So essentially we have practitioners and we have academic staff. This sometimes raises challenges, obviously, when we need to communicate, when we need to join the decisions that every partner would be happy about. But at the same time, I feel we have an opportunity to really learn from each other and to collaborate in a very fruitful way. Um, and I will start today from very far away, but I think it is important to make sure everyone is on the same page. So I will start from explaining what easy language is, even if I think most of you who came here probably know that already, but maybe people listening on Zoom uh, would benefit from that. So just to remind you, easy language is an alternative way of communicating where we are aiming to make our language as comprehensible as possible. This does not mean we avoid difficult topics. This does not mean we avoid difficult content. This essentially means we try to adapt our language, our words, our sentences, our structure of the language to make sure that the listener or the reader has the best chances of understanding what we want to say. So we modify our language in terms of vocabulary we choose, in terms of how we structure our sentences, and in terms of how we structure information. Um, and um, there are a lot of groups of people who benefit from this, and Tatiana has already briefly mentioned on that, uh, but um, we have people with intellectual disabilities, people within the spectrum of autism, people with dyslexia, people with language impairments that may be due to illness, injury, or trauma. We have people with dementia. We have second language speakers who may not have reached the level to understand standard language yet. And as you see, these are a lot of different groups of listeners or readers who would benefit from easy language. And as you can also see, they are very different between themselves. For some of them, easy language will be only necessary for a certain period of time because they might recover after a stroke or they might uh, recover after some injury or they might learn the second language to the extent that they will be proficient enough to function with standard language. For other people, easy language will be useful and necessary for their entire lives. And we want, if we want to have them participate in, um, in the society, if we want them to be able to work, if we want them to be able to go to the museum, to the bank, or to listen to the broadcast, uh, to radio, we need easy language for them. And this is gonna be a need for them during their all lives. So we have a very broad spectrum of people who need easy language. And as Tatiana mentioned, there are more of them than we sometimes think there are. Uh, what is being done, I would say quite actively now in many European countries, uh, is um, texts are being prepared in a written form in easy to read. You are probably familiar with the easy to read 
could you nod your heads if you are? Uh, yeah, and you may be familiar with this uh, icon of easy to read uh, that is designed by Inclusion Europe and used to mark texts that are prepared to be easy to read in a written format. So these texts follow certain guidelines. They are, again, using simple vocabulary, using simple linguistic structures, and uh, uh, they are... Uh, easy to recognize as easy to read texts because they are marked with those icons of easy to read. Um, this is an explanation of what easy to read is from the Inclusion Europe website. Easy to read information is important for people with intellectual disabilities. It is important so they can learn new things, take part in society, know their rights and stand up for them, make their own choices. So I put it here on the slides, uh, first of all, as an example of easy to read because it's written in easy to read. And as you can see straight away, uh, the information is structured very clearly. Uh, the text consists of uh, frequent and easy words only. The sentences are short um, and easy to comprehend. Here it talks about easy to read, but the, exactly the same things can be said about spoken easy. Sorry about that. Maybe we can use this. Sorry. Sorry about that. I guess it's better. So th this is said about easy to read, but essentially spoken easy would be the same thing, right? We need spoken language to learn new things. We need spoken language to take part in society. We need spoken language to make our own choices and to stand for a, for a, uh, stand up for our rights. So if we want to be really inclusive and in, if we want to allow those different groups of end users to actually take part in the life of society, written language is not enough. We need to think about spoken language as well. And if you stop for a minute and consider how reading is different from listening, well, it's obvious it's different and it is different in so many ways. In a way, speaking or listening can be much more challenging than reading because it happens online. And when I say online, I have online in mind in a psycholinguistic sense of the word. It happens here and now. You're listening to me and uh, I said a word and it disappeared. You have to interpret it right away. You have to focus on it. You have to put it together in all the word together all the words in the phrase to understand it and there's a time pressure for that very often we cannot stop we cannot repeat we cannot even ask questions in the situation like today so easily you cannot easily go back and re-listen in many situations. Also, you have not only the linguistic information to interpret, you have to interpret a lot of extra linguistic facts as well. You have to listen to the voice, intonation, body language. They are all important and they can all be communicating some information. So sometimes speaking and listening can be more of a challenge than reading. But actually, uh, at some perspectives, speaking and listening can be easier. Uh, we can, in conversations at least, repeat or be asked to repeat. We can be asked to clarify. And in general, we tend to speak in a less sophisticated way than we write because we don't have that much time to think, to work, to edit. Uh, so spoken language tends to be slightly easier than written language in any case. Um, but considering how different spoken and written language is, it becomes obvious that you cannot just take um, some guidelines and advice from written language and use it straight away for the spoken one. Also, when we think about spoken language, we have a lot of domains where it is used and we have a lot of different situations that highly influence how the language is used and what challenges it raises to the end users. So um, we have situations where the communication is one way. So I'm speaking, you are listening today, right? We have podcasts, news on the radio, audiobooks, audio guides, also presentations and sometimes trainings where the listener has to focus, has to pay attention, has to listen to the speaker speak and does not participate that much. 
This is very different from conversations where we have a two-way communication. We have to communicate with our partners and uh, we have a chance to interact. We have a chance to seek explanations if something is not clear, but at the same time, we have to participate. We have to give our own input. And these conversations differ a lot depending on how formal they are. Friendly conversation would be a lot different than a conversation with your work manager or conversation with your work team uh, and also conversations with doctors uh, or anywhere in the city would differ as well. So we have a lot of different contexts where we may use and may need uh, easy language and we have a lot of situations where um, instructors, people working in public sphere, or simply any one of us may need to communicate in easy language. Now, obviously, uh, there are specialists who work with people in need of easy language for years, and they have developed intuitions, and they have developed a lot of experience of how to speak with people who need easy language, how to adapt their language, and they are successful in that. And that is great. But if we want real inclusion in the society, those few people who have a lot of experience are not enough. If we want to have like news broadcasted on the radio, audio books, if we want to have doctors speaking in easy language, if someone who needs easy language comes to them, we do need to have some sort of guidelines of where to start, or what to think about and how to speak in spoken easy. Now, the guidelines that exist at the moment are mostly tailored for written language. This is the um, manual created by Inclusion Europe, Information for All. As some of you or probably most of you may have seen it. It is translated to numerous European languages and it's uh, widely used. Um, and it tends to give really good examples and advice, like um, in terms of using the words, it says use easy to understand words that people will know. Do not use difficult words. If you need to use difficult words, make sure, sure you explain them and so on and so forth. So these examples and these advice seem very relevant and important. But as these guidelines or other national guidelines are tailored to easy to read language, the question arises, is easy to read really equal to spoken easy? And once you start thinking about it, it definitely turns out it is not. Some principles are the same, especially when we think about vocabulary or syntax or how to you know, construct sentences. But in spoken language, we need to think about a lot of things that are not relevant for written language and a lot of suggestions for written language in terms of formatting, structuring the information, putting it all together are not relevant here at all. So the problem is there are no clear guidelines at the moment uh, that would instruct you how to start speaking in easy language. If you are someone who is not working with a target yet, if you are someone who has not the experience or um, you know the intuition you have developed for years and years of working uh, with these groups. And uh, here is where we come in as Celsi Project, trying to create those kind of guidelines, guidelines of spoken easy language that would give clear and precise suggestions on how to approach easy language when you are speaking easy language instead of writing an easy language. And here is the process of uh, creating those guidelines. So we started from doing research because we really wanted to make sure that our guidelines are empirical basis. Uh, for everything we are saying and that we are actually doing the work for the people who will use those guidelines instead of having to go and to read uh, a lot of academic papers or different guidelines in different countries they would have one document with a summary of it all uh, we based our first draft of these guidelines on research that conducted and we will go on to test those recommendations with end users and to find the guidelines based on what we found. And uh, here is how it worked a bit more in detail. So first of all, we had two sources of information. 
We started from our survey of specialists working with easy language and users of easy language. Uh, Tatiana has already commented a little bit on that. I will go a bit more in detail because I think it is uh, really important. So we had a survey of 15 countries. Uh, the countries that were represented the most were Italy, Lithuania, Latvia, Sweden, and Slovenia. And if you were listening attentively, you will notice that these are the countries where our project partners uh, come from. Uh, we had 446 responses and uh, uh, quite a bit of the age uh, differences between the respondents. So we actually have quite a lot of empirical data from people who either use easy language in their work as specialists or need easy language for communicating. Um, the reason for having those two groups was so that we can have the input from people who have those ex this experience and intuition, but also we get the feedback from, from the people who actually need easy language, what works, what they think is helpful, what is not. And uh, sometimes it is not that straightforward. Not everything that the specialist uses or thinks is helpful is necessarily helpful for the end user. So we tried to ask them for specific practices that they use facilitate their communication and if these practices are considered helpful by the end users. If you are interested in the results of the survey, uh, as Tatiana has mentioned, we have them online on our website, so you can uh, uh, read uh, the general overview, you can actually look at different countries and what different countries have said as well. But we also had another source of information at, and that was published research on easy language. So we've read uh, academic papers, we've read de doctoral dissertations, we've read uh, various guidelines for different countries in different languages, and we tried to put it all together to create a list as complete as possible of guidelines that would be helpful when learning, when starting to speak language. We ended up with a list of about 200 recommendations, so that was huge. And uh, we, we tried to group them, we tried to describe them, to make sense out of them, and to add examples to, to make the document more readable, to, to make the guidelines uh, more user-friendly. Uh, and uh, where we are at now is we have the very first draft of the guidelines, but it's there, and we we have the general structure of the guidelines as well, which I'm going to show you today. So we have divided those 200 recommendations into five sections. Uh, and uh, we hope that we cover, well, if not all, most of the topics that would be interested and interesting and important for people who want to speak an easy language. So we start from the question, how to engage your interlocutor, how to engage your conversation partner. And uh, in this section, we try to cover most questions that could and should arise when preparing for a conversation, a talk, a training session in easy language, like how to address your interlocutor, how to get and keep your interlocutor's attention, and how to encourage your interlocutor, how to create a pleasant atmosphere and show respect. Uh, and all these would be important both in a conversation and in a presentation or a training session. And things like keeping your interlocutor's attention might not be that uh, self-explanatory and that easy when we're thinking about the groups of people who need language, groups of people who have cognitive issues or language issues. Uh, then we move to the questions about how to structure your talk, how to structure information, how to emphasize information, how to make sure that the structure of your talk is actually helpful to convey information that you want to convey instead of making it more difficult to comprehend it. Uh, we have a section on how to adapt one's language, how to think about your vocabulary, your sentence structure, how to simplify your your sentences, your utterances, how to think about uh, like the natural order of the thoughts that you want to communicate. 
We also talk a lot about nonverbal communication because this is spoken language, right? So you have to think about how do you use your voice? How do you use pauses? How do you use body language? And things like articulating clearly, making enough pauses, thinking about how you use your voice to speak clearly, uh, loudly enough, are the things you would not normally consider in a conversation in standard language because we are all very experienced language users in everyday conversations but when we need to stop and think about how to become more comprehensible these things uh, these matters of nonverbal communication become really important and finally we give advice on how to use visual aids how to use uh, pictures or um, um, various drawings and themes, how to add audio materials, if they can help you understand the language and what to consider in terms of deciding the environment and the surroundings of your conversation or talk or presentation. Now, when I uh, give you those five topics um, and I talk about them, it may seem very straightforward, like in any good conversation, you could think, you should think about how to address your interlocutor, how to structure your talk, how to adapt your language, because we all adapt our language all the time, right? I speak differently when I speak to my friends, and I speak differently when I speak in a public presentation. Uh, we all use the verbal communication to a certain level, and we sometimes use supporting materials like slides. Uh, so it may seem that it is all very straightforward and that we all know this anyway, but it's not actually the case because if we want to be extra comprehensible, if we want to make sure that the information we are conveying actually in spoken easy and easy to understand, we have to make a step, an extra step. We have to add this extra thought to make sure you, we are kind of giving our conversation partner the best chances of understanding. So these are the big topics, uh, the five big questions that we ask. I have shown you the sub-questions, the smaller questions. Uh, and for each of these uh, small questions, like how to address your conversation partner, we have a very clear guidelines our suggestion what you should what you should be doing and how so in the how to address your interlocutor what session talk directly to your interlocutor which means in the eye contact physically face the person you are talking to say you to them instead of saying something about them to the person accompanying them and so on. So we do have very clear uh, suggestions with examples, to, with explanations for each of those points. Um, and uh, we are aiming to cover the communication presentations, training sessions, broadcasts, audiobooks. We're also trying to look at the two-way communication, like conversations, and we're trying to make sure that no matter what kind of situation you need the spoken easy language in, you will get some advice on how to proceed and what to think about. So we've done the research, we have the first draft now, we're down to testing the recommendations and refining the guidelines based on them. Well, as you can imagine, there are quite a few recommendations that we give, so we're definitely not testing all of them, but there's no need to test all of them either because some of them have been already tested. That's why we're using empirical research done by other people before us. Some of them are just common sense or politeness, like facing the person you're talking to. Probably no one would argue that, you know, that's not a good idea. Probably that is kind of obvious. So we are um, choosing the recommendations that we think are the most valuable ones to test, uh, that are the least explored so far, and that, you know, testing them would give the most benefit for the end user and for the specialists needing to, uh, to use 
uh, easy language. Now, I will not be giving you a lot of details about the testing you do. I'm sure we will be presenting that in, in Malmö, in Sweden, in spring. Uh, but essentially what we're working in now is identifying those recommendations that will be tested in the frame of this project and uh, developing a framework for testing them uh, with the end users of easy language. And uh, I hope once we have them tested and once we have the um, recommendations ready, we will update uh, the, the draft that we have now. We will include information about testing and the final findings of uh, our testing stage. And you will definitely be able to find those recommendations for Spoken Easy online on SELS website. Uh, so make sure you, you check it and uh, you access them when you need them. And uh, once again, these are all the partners working together on this project. And I hope that this collaboration between academia and uh, um, practitioners who actually use easy language a lot will be a fruitful one and that you will find those uh, guidelines and recommendations that we suggest to be useful for your purposes. CELSI, spoken easy language for social inclusion. Partners are Zavo Trisa, RTV Slovenia, Dyslexi Verbundet, Università degli Studi di Trieste, Vieglas Valodas Agentura, Vilnius Universitetas, Vsi Informatio Scaupimo Irsklaidos Centras. Funded by the European Union.